Welcome into the On3 studios here in Nashville, Tennessee. This is a brand new show to the On3 Recruits channel. It's called the Wilt Fong Whip Around, and it'll feature On3's newest hire, Steve Wiltfong. Yes, the man himself is now here at On3. Now, I'm going to host the show, and the Wilt Fong Whip Around will air on Mondays and Thursdays. It's going to be action-packed, just like everything on the On3 Recruits channel. We're going to hit on all the breaking news and latest recruiting rumors. Anything that goes on in the recruiting world, me and Steve are going to cover it. Now, I'm really excited for this. We're going to get into today's show where Steve and I break down Notre Dame's biggest remaining needs, Ohio State's hot start, and can they maintain it? We're also going to talk a little Tennessee recruiting, and then we're going to bring in Chad Simmons. Yes, Chad Simmons and Steve Wiltfong on the same set to talk QBs. A lot of, lot of action happening. Big show today, the Wiltfong whip around. Let's get to it. Notre Dame is racking up the commitments early. The Irish are currently sitting with the number five class in America. The question is, though, can they maintain this pace? I got on three Steve Wiltfong here with me. We're going to break it all down in this video. But first, remember to hit subscribe to the on three recruits channel. All right, Steve, the foundation of Notre Dame's class really built on two players. Quarterback Deuce Knight from Mississippi and offensive tackle Will Black from Connecticut. How is Notre Dame able to lock these two down so early in the recruiting cycle? Well, you know Notre Dame's famed pot of gold day every St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> uh, they, the coaching staff gets on the horn and starts uh, connecting with their top targets. Well, Deuce Knight got his offer on pot of gold day two years ago. Uh, and, and ultimately committed to the Irish, picking Notre Dame over Auburn, mm -hmm. Ole Miss, Tennessee, several others. He's a guy that brings something different to that quarterback room. The way Marcus Freeman and that staff has elevated the way Notre Dame has upgraded their quarterback room since he got there through the transfer portal with Sam Hartman and Riley Leonard, and then on the recruiting trail, flipping Kenny Minchie from Pittsburgh, landing C.J. Carr, beating Michigan for the legacy recruit, and then getting Deuce Knight in the fold, who ultimately you picture a guy that would be six foot five, 240 pounds, 4'5 speed. There's all kinds of possibilities with a quarterback like that in South Bend. So major pickup, pot of gold day, I think really set the tone in that recruitment and Gino Godalgi and company took it from there. And then Will Black, I mean, they beat Michigan for him yeah, and that's hard huge. to do. I mean, Michigan, they've won two Joe Moore awards under Sharon Moore, uh, played in the college football playoff three straight years, won the national championship. But Notre Dame, they have a ton of pedigree in their offensive line room as well. And this young man looks like their next first rounder. And when you look at college or NFL football on Sundays, there's a lot of former Notre Dame They're guys hard. still playing at an all-pro level. Joe Alt, going to hear his name called early in this April draft. And Will Black choosing Notre Dame over Michigan, among others. You talked about this being the foundation of their class, Josh. They got three really good offensive linemen committed. Matty Augustine and Owen Strebig were heavily recruited. And they've done a great job in the secondary as well, led by Ivan Taylor, a uh, legacy uh, NFL legacy recruit, son of Ike Taylor. Yeah, uh, Notre Dame's absolutely crushing it. But I want to know, do you like their strategy? They're almost at 20 commitments, and we just turned the page to April. Do you think this is good for Notre Dame? Well, these are the players they want. These are the players they covet. Mm -hmm. I think absolutely it's a good thing to get them in the fold. Now, every recruiting class in the country sees some guys ultimately end up elsewhere at the end of the day, and Notre Dame's no different. But getting these guys in the fold early, these are the players that are at the top of their board, and they have them locked in, and now they can peer recruit. These, yeah. They're out there recruiting each other. They're building meaningful relationships as friends. They're already envisioning who's going to room with who. and, <laughs> and how They're, they're in gonna, the group chat together. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I think and, – and Notre Dame on the trail right now, when they're recruiting their final top targets, they now have 18 commits that are kind of helping the cause. Yeah. All right, so like you said, they have a lot of commitments. Uh, what do you think they need to do? There's a lot of time left between now and signing day. What do you think the most important need left to fill is between now and signing day? Well, I think that they got four players on their board right now that they covet. Uh, they've already done a really good job in the secondary, but they want to add to it to play that championship mm -hmm. level defense that they're looking to towards doing. Mark Zachary from Indianapolis, Ben Davis is a top target that I have an RPM for Notre Dame uh, uh, for him as, as they battle Michigan and Florida. For, uh, among others for him. And then you have Jadon Blair, another defensive back that they would like to add to the floor to, uh, fold to, to complete what would be one of the best secondary halls yeah. 
in America. Dallas Golden is another player from, from Florida that they covet, that they could lead for at this point in the process. And then receiver Derek Meadows. I mean, Notre yeah. Dame, they're young at wide receiver, but I think they've gotten more electric in that room since Marcus Freeman and this staff has taken over. And now there's kind of a standard they're recruiting to. And Derek Meadows out of Las Vegas, Bishop Gorman, is uh, one of their top players on the board regardless of position. And I think that Notre Dame is the team to beat as he goes into his next wave of visits. All right, Notre Dame fans, talk to us. Let us know. How do you feel about this recruiting class? Who do you think the most important remaining target is? Comment section below. The Tennessee Volunteers, they have their quarterback. The foundation for this 2025 class is set. But Josh Heupel and his staff got a lot more remaining on the board. In this video, we're going to break down Tennessee's recruiting class. But first, Tennessee fans, do me a favor. Jump on board the On3 Recruit channel. Hit subscribe. We're talking Tennessee recruiting all cycle. Go ahead. Hit subscribe. All right. Let's bring on two goats. I got with me On3, Steve Wiltfong and Chad Simmons. Now, guys, look. Tennessee right now currently sitting outside the top 10. Last cycle, they finished at number 13. So I want to know. Does Tennessee have the juice on the trail to finish top 10 this cycle? Well, they're in on the right names if they want to make a run for the top 10 recruiting class. Guys like David Sanders Jr., Andrew Babalola. The Vols are trying to sign a special offensive line class this cycle. Trey McNutt, a safety from Ohio. Bo Jackson, a running back from Ohio. There are a lot of blue chippers that are keeping an eye on Tennessee right now that are going to continue taking visits there this summer. Yeah, they're in on Jamie French and many other playmakers, too, obviously. I think they're in the right spot, like you said, Steve, with the heavy hitters, uh, five stars, four stars, top guys to get involved with. All right, you guys hit on it. You talked about offensive line a little bit. And last year, they made a major run at Jordan Seton. Didn't work out. This year, it's David Sanders. He's the prize for Tennessee. I got I to gotta know, though, do you think – Tennessee has a real shot at landing the number one offensive tackle in America. The simple answer is yes. They're, they're very much in the mix, Josh. I mean, you probably agree, Steve, I think, with that. We talked about him before, obviously, with Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State. But Tennessee's right there, a major school there. I think position of need probably starts with the offensive line at Tennessee, from David Sanders to Juan Gaston to Jalen Matthews. You mentioned Andrew Babaloa. You know, they're in for some top – uh, offensive lineman, and that's a big need. That and D-line, I think, are one and two for them in this class, this cycle. They're very much involved with David Sanders. He's made some rounds this spring, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State. He has officials coming up with them, South Carolina, but Tennessee, they still have their two visits, an unofficial in April, and then the official visit in June. Feels a great connection with that coaching staff. I think Tennessee absolutely is very much in it for David Sanders Jr. And anyone projecting a school for him right now, I think is premature because I could still see him ending up at a few different places. All right, lots of recruiting left, but it's starting to heat up in the spring, and then we know what happens in the summer. Uh, what do you guys think, though, Tennessee must accomplish in the 2025 cycle? Well, I like the way that Tennessee's been recruiting on the defensive side of the football, and for them to continue to add difference makers in that front seven I think is key for them as they continue their trajectory as a program. When you look at the teams that compete for an SEC championship year in and year out, they're typically really good at quarterback, and I love the way that Tennessee has recruited that position under center, but they need to continue to land difference makers year in and year out in the front seven that can play championship-level football. That's how they will continue to make the next steps in the sport. Yeah, all about the trenches, I think, to finish out this class. But then you get look in state too, Cameron Sparks, Ray Darius Jackson, guys that want to play with a guy like George McIntyre to make big plays on the skill positions as well. So I think if you start at home, you just got Ethan Utley last week. You want to get Cameron Smarks, Sparks. You want to get Jackson from Memphis. I think you'll go there as well. All right, Tennessee fans, let's talk about it. Is this a top 10 class this cycle? Let me know. Comment section below. Who's your most important recruit for Tennessee this cycle? Comment section below. The Buckeyes are recruiting with a sense of urgency this offseason. That's what happens when your rival wins the national championship. In this video, though, I'm talking Ohio State recruiting with on three Steve Wiltfong. But first, Ohio State fans, do me a favor. Remember to jump on board and hit subscribe to the on three recruits channel. All right. Now, the best DB class in America lies in Columbus with Ohio State. They got Naeem Alford and Devin Sanchez, the number one in two ranked corners in America, along with Blake Woodby. But Steve, they don't have any safeties committed yet. So can this DB class get even better? They're in on several of the nation's best. In the secondary, you have Fahim Delani out of Good Council High. 
in Maryland, one of the most coveted safeties in America. Trey McNutt from in-state Cleveland Shaker Heights. He's another that Ohio State's well-positioned for. And Dorian Brew, a defensive back who's playing his final high school season in the Lone Star State, has the Ohio State ties. He's another guy that has the Buckeyes on the short list. So as Ohio State looks to maintain on three's number one ranked recruiting class for the rest of the cycle, the secondary is a place where they can still eat quite a bit. You got any early RPMs in on any of these guys? Well, I'm still working the R. I'm still getting I'm a few of the RPM things. So, uh, <laughs> but I think by the time you guys are watching this video, I will have Ohio State RPM picks logged. Several of them. Mm. All right. Now let's move to the wide receiver position. Ohio State only has one wide receiver committed right now. So, who are Brian Hartline's top remaining targets at the position? Well, there's several that they're strongly in the mix for that he covets. You have Jamie French from Jacksonville, Florida, Mandarin. That's an RPM pick that I have in <laughs> for go. the Buckeyes. Vernell Brown the third from Orlando. He's another that I have an RPM pick. Now in he's for a Florida the- Gator legacy. Yeah. You have him predicted to Ohio State? Though. I like where the Buckeyes stand. I think that they're setting the tone in this recruitment. A recent visit to Florida yeah. State, an eye opener. They look forward to seeing what Florida does this season. Get got there a couple times. In the spring, went up to Syracuse, a UCF's in there, but I think it's Ohio State setting the bar for Vernell. And then you have DeCorian Moore, the number one ranked receiver in the on three rankings, currently committed to LSU. Talked to him after he visited Ohio State this spring. He loved watching the way they practice. He thought that was the reason. He got a sense for why Brian Hartline has been so successful at developing receivers by taking in that one spring practice. He enjoyed being around the players on the team talking to the receivers in the room, I think was big hearing about their experience at Ohio State. He saw that as an environment for him. And then Kalik Lockett's another uh, five-star receiver that visited Ohio State this spring. And I think that has thrusted them into this recruitment as well as a place that not only develops receivers, but him and his family saw it as a place where they like the way that they develop young men there. He thinks that's a culture and a locker room that he can really fit in. Yeah, I, it's always intriguing to see who Brian Hartline targets and who he ends up landing, but we know they're, it's going to be a great wide receiver class. All right, wrap it up. What do you consider Ohio State's biggest remaining need in the 2025 cycle? I can't give you one. I think that point of attack recruiting, yeah. offensive tackle, defensive end, is a position that they're really going to zero in on and try and land elite players at David Sanders Jr., the top-ranked offensive tackle in the country out of Charlotte, visited here at the end of the spring, going to come back for his official visit. The Buckeyes are slated for the last official in June. And then Darren Akunabon uh, out of Hillside, New Jersey, is another prospect that Ohio State looks to be on the short list for, absolutely coveted on the board. Uh, so Ohio State, Offensive tackle, defensive end, those are two places where they hope to make a lot of hay as this process continues. Absolutely. And, you know, Ohio State, they have a shot at the number one class, Steve. We're going to be talking a lot of Ohio State this offseason. I appreciate you for stopping by the inside scoop today. QB dominoes, that's what we're talking in this video because of the top 10 quarterbacks in America, six of the 10 are already committed and the other four could be coming off the board soon. I got two heavy hitters in here with me to break it all down. We got Steve Wiltfong and Chad Simmons on set with us. But first, remember to jump on board and hit subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. All recruiting all the time. That's why we're here. So hit subscribe. All right, let's take a look at the top 10. You see Bryce Underwood here at number one. We know he's committed to LSU. We're going to circle back on him in a minute. But number two, we got quarterback Julian Lewis out of Carrollton, Georgia, and he is committed to USC. But I kind of view this commitment a little bit different than Underwood's to LSU. So I wanted to get your guys' opinion on the spring tour that Julian Lewis is on. What's your opinion on Julian Lewis and and kind of some of the schools that he's still looking at? Well, his recruitment's very fluid, Josh. Uh, obviously with him taking all these visits. But getting back to USC this USC this past weekend was big for Lincoln Riley and the Trojans because any time that I talk to Julian or talk to his father, TC, and we start talking about USC again, he starts to bring up all the reasons why they're committed to the Trojans. You know, Lincoln Riley, his track record of developing Heisman Trophy winners and first-rounders, not just first-rounders, but the first overall pick at the position. And they it's you get a little FOMO uh, when they talk about USC 
and maybe moving on because they know what they would potentially be giving up at USC. If it's not me under center for Lincoln Riley, it's probably going to be someone that's going to have a chance to win the Heisman Trophy and get drafted in the first round. With that being said, though, he sees a lot of opportunity at Georgia, sees some opportunity at Alabama with that new coaching staff. He's already been out to Colorado twice uh, including two weekends ago. Indiana, they're trying to kick tires there. Uh, Coach Sunseri's recruited him as long as anybody. Uh, uh, but USC getting him back this, this past weekend was big. Uh, but I certainly still would not be surprised if we saw him playing in the SEC uh, when his college career takes off. Yeah, Steve, does he want to go across the country? Does he want to stay close to home? Alabama's been always a long-time contender. Georgia in-state school. Auburn, I think, definitely has piqued this interest as well as a school. Been there a couple of times this year, too. The Hugh Freeze, the offense there to play in. So, like you mentioned, SEC versus Lincoln Riley development, uh, the draft picks, the offensive scheme. Uh, you know, I, I would describe his commitment, even coming off this visit, it may be as shaky. It's obviously not solid, uh, not locked in. He will take those OVs as well. Uh, I think that'll be a big time for him, these OVs in June. As big as these trips are right now in the offseason, I think the OVs really make the lasting impression and then make that final decision late in the summer. I think Georgia – They'd like to sign two quarterbacks this cycle. They tried to sign two last cycle, as that's well documented. They want to get that room to that scholarship number that they're looking for. And if Julian Lewis does not pick Georgia the second time, I still would expect the Bulldogs to hang in there all the way to the finish line and then try and get some K.J. Bolden-type magic at the end. Yeah, we saw how that two QB works for Georgia last year. They had, they had two for a while, only one in the end with Ron Puglisi staying and Dylan Rayle going to Nebraska. Really good conversation here. I, uh, the Julian Lewis recruitment is very nuanced, and there's a lot of teams involved, kind of like an East Coast versus West Coast battle here. Uh, Got to ask, guys, before we move on, which way are you leaning when it comes to Julian Lewis, flipping or sticking with USC commitment? I think – yeah, I think, I, I think you know, That's tough. I mean, I still ultimately think that he's taking all these visits for a reason. He's dotting I's, he's crossing T's. Uh, and, and like I said at the top, there's a lot of reasons for him potentially sticking at USC. Uh, but with so many other schools in play, I still uh, think that I would put the odds in favor that he – uh, it goes elsewhere. Yeah, I agree. It's like saying like Tiger versus the field, right. you know, and I, I, I probably lean towards, you know, Alabama, Georgia, Auburn. Uh, those three have a legit, ch legit chance to flip him. Okay, then we're going to move on from Julian Lewis. Now at number three, we have George McIntyre who's committed to Tennessee. Number four, Tavian St. Clair, who is committed to Ohio State. Then we get to number five, Matt Zollers out of Pennsylvania, and he is uh, maybe the next to come off the board. He's still taking visits. Do you guys think that he's ready to make this decision coming soon? Absolutely. Likely. I think he, he is ready. I mean, he's, he's been – I didn't mean to cut you off, Steve, but he's been a guy I think that's been, at least to me, he wants to get this done as soon as he can. He finished out basketball, went to Missouri. We'll go to Pitt, Penn State, Alabama, Georgia – April 4th the day. So, I mean, there's no doubt he wants to get this done as soon as he can. Uh, these visits will play a big, I think, factor in the final decision. I think right now, going into these, or these, these final visits that he took, um, he still has Georgia. He's just fresh off Penn State, fresh off Pitt, where his older brother is a walk-on defensive lineman. But he was at Missouri roughly two weeks ago. That was a return trip. People aren't talking about Eli Drinkwitz and this staff's position enough. Kirby Moore, he's really clicked with that coaching staff, loves the offense, loves the trajectory of the program. They finished in the top 10 this past year, have, have a good chance to play in the college football playoff this coming season. Um, he just has a great time when he's in Columbia. And I think that, I think based on the intel I'm hearing right now, that he is likely SEC bound. So I think you're looking at Missouri and you're looking at Georgia, unless this recent visit to Alabama, as they have tried to come into the picture here late, as they try and that, that new staff tries to figure out their 2025 quarterback situation, unless they made a major move, I think it's up to Georgia. 
Missouri, Missouri really uh, showed him everything. At Georgia, his last visit, got a chance to hang with the staff, see the academic side of things. I think coming back, getting a chance to spend more time with the players, spend more time watching practice, uh, that's going to be pivotal here because he has all his questions answered with Missouri. And Eli Drinkwitz and the Tigers are in a good position. Uh, but Georgia, we've seen them close strong. So it uh, could be an interesting uh, battle for those two down the stretch. Yeah, it's funny how it goes. You got Missouri had the first visit. George gets the last visit two days prior to that decision being made. His plan is to go home, take that 24 hours on the third, make that decision. Uh, I know he's up there talking about Juju Lewis with Georgia, Zollers with Georgia. Um, to me, based on intel, those are Georgia's top two quarterbacks. Do they get one? Could they get both? Likely not both. But we'll know about Zollers next week. And if they don't, and and then if if Georgia has to pivot again, you got Ryan Montgomery out there too, who we'll talk about later in this episode. Now we're moving on to number six. We got Deuce Knight. Now he is committed to Notre Dame. He's from the state of Mississippi. But the question is, and everybody's watching, especially Notre Dame fans, will he take visits? Guys, I want to throw that to you. Will Deuce Knight take visits? We know Notre Dame has a policy. They don't like their commitments taking visits, so it could kind of rattle the cage a little bit. Do you guys think Deuce Knight only checks out Notre Dame, or does he take other trips? That one's kind of ebb and flowed on if he will or won't take visits. You know, the new Alabama staff made an impression on him. Colorado at one point looked to be ramping it up, but Coach Shermer, Coach Prime and company all in on Julian Lewis right now uh, at that position. And, and then Ole Miss uh, has been mentioned. Auburn has been mentioned. I, I think if he continues to take phone calls throughout the season, you're always worried about that. But he was just back at Notre Dame, multiple day visit, uh, got to watch a couple spring practices, get back around the program. There's no question he loves the Irish and and, and uh, Coach Guadalgi, Coach Freeman, and, and they love him. You know, you look at the quarterbacks that Notre Dame has in that room right now, uh, uh, from Riley Leonard to uh, Kenny Minchie. To, to C.J. Carr, he brings a different element um, when, when, when Riley Leonard moves on. He could be six foot five, 240 pounds, run a 4'5", 40. He can add that element and, and, and really be someone that gets on the field early for the Irish in, in some packages because of that skill set. Yeah, I think right now, I think if you're the Irish, you have to like where you sit with Deuce Knight. I think he feels very confident in his decision, very comfortable. I think he does have communication going, at least what I know, with Alabama and Ole Miss for sure. Uh, Still some conversations. They definitely obviously pique his interest there. But I think if you're Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman, you feel pretty good about where you're at. So going back to your question, Josh, does he take visits? Right now, I would lean towards not. I think he feels good about what would he like to, sure, but with the policy like it is with Dabo, Sweeney, and Clemson, if you're committed here, you're with us. Uh, I, I like where Notre Dame's at right now. Still talking on the phone. What is this, April? Yeah, long way to That's go. a lot of phone conversations. Long way to, to go. Get, get in the car and go yeah. check somebody out. Long way to go. We will see Deuce Knight. Solidly committed to Notre Dame. Don't want you guys to think otherwise, but will he take some visits down the road? We'll see. All right, number seven, we got Houston Longstreet out of California. Boys, will Houston Longstreet stay on the West Coast, or is he East Coast bound? I think he's going to play in the SEC. I think I'm looking at Auburn, and I'm looking at Texas A&M. And for a lot of the spring, I've liked where the Aggies have stood with Houston Longstreet. And he just returned to College Station. Um, visit, return, potentially coming back up with Auburn. He has Oregon. On the, on the books, but I think that's going to get switched to Auburn. He was just at Auburn recently and had a fantastic visit getting around Hugh Freeze and that coaching staff. Just the chemistry that Hugh Freeze has with his coaches, the longevity they've had working together, I think that really stood out to him and his experience. This is an Under Armour kid. He was in an Under Armour commercial with Tom Brady. Uh, and, and that's an easy transition from an NIL standpoint to the Plains. And, and I think that's a factor. Now, his number one factor is player development, getting developed to being a first-round quarterback. I think that they see the way that Auburn has recruited the wide receiver position uh, and Hugh Freeze's track record of posting big numbers. That's enticing. But he's built a really good relationship with Coach Klein at Texas A&M, and I know that they feel like from a depth point, a depth chart standpoint, that's an opportunity for him to step in on a roster that is very competitive in every other room and be the guy under center a little earlier. And then also, they, he likes Mike Elko and company. They're feeling it at Texas A&M. These two programs, I think, are in the best position over UCLA, Oregon, and some others. No, I agree. I think if you were to ask me about you know Longstreet six weeks ago, 
with straight thumbs up with Texas A&M. If Auburn gets him back on campus for April 6th spring game, mm -hmm. this thing could swing pretty quickly nope. momentum-wise back to and Auburn's it might be way. Now. Yeah, I, th I think it's gotten much, much tighter <laughs> no now question. with Auburn right there. They got all the buzz around it right now. If they get him back, you know, coming up here, um, I, I like where Auburn would be sitting at that point for sure. Yeah. You know. Auburn did a good job getting Walker White last year, and the er returns on him early are strong. Uh, but we thought maybe they were going to have some magic in the portal at the position, so maybe that magic is uh, getting uh, maneuvered here to the 2025 recruiting class. A little pixie dust going out west here as Auburn may pull this one out for Hussan Longstreet over A&M. We'll see. All right, and then at number eight, we have KJ Lacey. He's out of the state of Alabama, and he's committed to Texas. Number nine, Achilles Smith Jr. He is committed to Oregon. And at number 10, we have Antoine Hill. He is uncommitted from Warner's Robin, Georgia. But I kind of want to tie another quarterback in with his recruitment, and that's at number 14, Ryan Montgomery. For some reason, they kind of seem tied together. Uh, they're also looking at similar schools. So, uh, guys, how do you see the recruitments of Antoine Hill and Ryan Montgomery playing out and maybe even overlapping each other. And Keelan Russell may be at it. This is, we're in a, some quarterback dominoes there yeah. now, Josh, yeah. as you Florida, talk about Florida. it. Florida with all three of those guys. You yeah, know, very much in play. But Texas A&M, yeah. you know, depending on what happens with a couple guys, they could be involved. Auburn, again, like they'll have to pivot if they don't land. And I think those are guys that are all – prime candidates for all those programs. But right now, certainly, uh, Florida has done a really good job with Antoine Hill. And he has also talked highly about Texas A&M himself in, in the past. So I think that's one where the Aggies, if they had the pivot, they could make a, a, a nice run So, at so him. when Florida takes their quarterback, who, whichever it is, is it going to kind of dictate maybe the destinations of an Antoine Hill around Montgomery? Like, it, are they dependent on what Florida does at the quarterback position? Well, I think Ryan Montgomery is the target that Florida um, – is super high on, and South Carolina. Right. you know, I think top guy for both those programs. And you know, I think we could see him back at Carolina in April. Uh, we know he'll be at Florida in April as well for a spring practice. Um, OVs could be OV to South Carolina. I'm told in April at some point, uh, he has Florida in June, Georgia's Georgia in June right. as well. Um, the third weekend, you know, right? So yeah. And I think fourth weekend before that, I think Florida is. So, um, you know, I really thought by this time he would be committed by now. Uh, Ryan Montgomery. Uh, I thought he was close to a decision at some point. There's been some some buzz around maybe Carolina having a slight advantage, but Napier, Ryan O'Hare done a great job with the family. Montgomery himself as a quarterback, but there is a definite connection with all those kids with different schools. I think Ryan Montgomery feels close with Dal Logans at, at South Carolina and Coach Beamer. Anytime he goes down there, he feels at home. Uh, to, to your point, Coach Napier, Coach O'Hara gives them the same feel at Florida. I have felt like South Carolina's had the edge there, but any one of those teams could come bursting through. And if Georgia if if Georgia turns it up for, for him, yeah. you know, they could become the Cosmo Kramer of that recruitment coming through the door hard there. And he just visited Louisville on his way down to Florida for a spring break and had a good time with the Brom brothers. And we've seen Louisville make some some moves here on the trail in this era as well. So maybe they get into that the, the picture there for Ryan Montgomery as well. All right. Well, you can kind of see how the QB dominoes fall and how they are kind of dependent on one another. So we're going to cover this as long as the spring goes on. Um, I did say I want to circle back to Bryce Underwood because he's the number one quarterback in America and he's committed to LSU, but he's also the number one quarterback in the state of Michigan. Michigan coming off this national title. Just real quick, fellas, do you think Michigan makes another legitimate run at Bryce Underwood before this is over? No, they have they have their guy committed in Carter Smith from Florida. Now, we're, it's there's no way you could predict that right now. You know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what teams look like this fall. Uh, but he loves LSU, been there several times, and I think that Michigan likes the guy that they have in the fold. And although they would still take Bryce Underwood, um, I think that right now I don't expect the Wolverines to make a run. Now we'll see what it looks like on Saturdays. No, I agree. Yeah. Now we're going to do a little bonus round of QB dominoes. The 2026 QBs are already starting to come off the board. Just recently we saw number three-ranked quarterback Jared Curtis commit to UGA. So, guys, who could be next from the 2026 class to be the next major commitment on the QB level? Well, 
I'm looking at Brady Hart, Noah Grubbs from the Sunshine State, Florida. State Diabell, I think is a guy that's on my radar to watch. He told me from day one he wants to commit maybe as soon as he can, um, and that could be late spring. Yeah, who, who do you like in that one? I know that he's had a great time at I'll Ohio State recently. Tell you State who to watch recently. here, Texas, Penn State, Penn. Texas, LSU, talking about Bryce Underwood. Joe Sloan is doing a heck of a job building relationships there. He's been there a couple of times. Texas is the new school, I think, to watch. Offered him here recently. He was on campus for a day and a half or so. Uh, but I think Penn State, kind of sneaky, has been in this one for a while. Then you have Miami, the school in his backyard. I think those four schools for me, Miami, LSU, Penn State, and Texas. LSU is uh, definitely in the mix strongly for Faison Brandon as well. Going back to Brady Hart and Noah Grubbs, uh, Noah recently at Notre Dame. They're certainly first, second, or third in his recruitment. Ohio State and Michigan are, are a couple others that are high with him. He's also visiting Miami, and, and, and so we'll see what happens with the Hurricanes. Well, Florida offer too, which is big for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have an RPM on Notre Dame for Brady Hart right now, uh, visiting South Bend on April 2nd. Um, but that doesn't mean Notre Dame doesn't lead for some other guys right now. Uh, you got the, the Smeagol kid from California. I think Michigan's in a really good spot for him, but Notre Dame's a player there too. I wouldn't be surprised if Notre Dame gets their quarterback early in, in this cycle and then starts building their class out. Again, they have a top five class right now in 2024, and I think that uh, it, they're able to pivot to 2026 with how many guys they have in the fold right now for 2025. And, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those quarterbacks is in the fold for the Irish. Soon. Yeah, if you can go Carr, Deuce Knight, Brady Hart, you're doing okay. Back-to-back -back years in quarterback. Well, look at this. The 2025 quarterback dominoes are falling, and so are the 2026. An exciting time of the year. You guys, let me know. Comment section below. How do you guys see the dominoes falling? Who do you think will land who? Let me know. Comment section below. Thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoyed that, go check out the hundreds of videos that we have on this channel, and also 